On September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, unleashing the Second World War. The word Blitzkrieg becomes a part of our vocabulary. A valiant battle against overwhelming odds seems concluded after 28 days when Warsaw falls to the German invaders. Or did it end with the fall of Warsaw? This is the story of the Air Force that never surrendered. Like the proverbial phoenix, the White Eagle rose from the ashes of their country, fighting in defense of others' freedom, echoing the rally cry, for our freedom and yours. Theirs was an unparalleled achievement as they flew to greater glory, fighting not only above their native land, but in borrowed skies. On the first, on the first of it, September 39, I was uh, in a squadron in Warsaw, in defense of Warsaw. We were already in the, uh, on the field, airfield. Uh, uh, I think we departed our main uh, main uh, aerodrome in Warsaw, Okinje, three days before, and uh, we were in the field waiting. And uh, sure enough, it started. Captain Laskowski called us for a meeting, and he said shortly, gentlemen, we are at war with Germany. You know your job, thank you, that's all. And we went to machines. Just before the war, I was in three years, before the war, I was instructor uh, in fighter school. It was in uh, Dublin. And the 1st of September, uh, very early in the morning, I was flying with uh, one a cadet for gunnery and acrobatic and uh, dog fighting. And when we returned, uh, suddenly I find he was flying behind me. And suddenly I find that uh, somebody shooting, you know, the line. And I was mad because I know that he has some more, saved some ammunition and he didn't save uh, guns. And he just pushed and he's shooting. So I didn't say anything at all, but I said, what should I do with him to fire? He was too good. So anyhow, uh, we flew again uh, and we landed. After landing, suddenly everybody was uh, running to my airplane. And uh, one of my friends, he said, we told you should go immediately to the church and to offer such one uh, meter candle and to pray for your life. And I was even more mad because the one that cadet was shooting behind me and they are just making fun. And I said, just quiet. I am so mad. He said, Vito, don't you know that it's war? You were attacked by message with 109. First thing in the morning, it was still dark. And we were at readiness. There were two squadrons in the defense of war for plus one flight uh, from Krakow. Um, well, there it was, and so uh, we started. We the first the uh, first raid of Germans was uh, arriving at around about six o'clock in the morning. We took up and uh, we just tried to attack them, stop them coming to Warsaw. And uh, mm, as a matter of fact, they didn't, I don't think they expected uh, uh, any defense because they came without fighters. And uh, <coughs> so there was, uh, I don't think they really dropped any bombs on Warsaw, uh, just outside, and they disperse and disappear. When the war started, the, we were going not the strategic targets, rather tactical targets. And uh, for example, on the 1st of 
September, one of the carriages went south over Nova Sond and to Czechoslovakia. And there I don't remember now the name of the village, but he brought the photographs where in one village on the marketplace were placed very nice uh, all the panzers and they call it uh, what you call big lorries lo loaded with everything. It was standing on the marketplace and behind the village. Beautiful target. But I was duty officer at the f first. Our commander was at the uh, command of the group and then he phoned about 11 o'clock we were no, not going to bomb because you know the British Chamberlain sent the telegram to Hitler that give him time to 11 o'clock on the 3rd if he don't read, uh, stop war England will declare the war. I took off, I'd, I had about uh, 1,500 1, meters over, and I looked in front of me, lower about 300 uh, meters, uh, uh, no, reconnaissance aeroplane German, Henschel, 126, two-seater. So I went down, I got already, because the, our speed were approximately the same, when I get out, so it could get, get out. But I had a, I was higher, about 1,000 feet, so I had a good speed. I get down and, and I open fire and so on. They had a, the rear gunner, I mean na navigator, also opened fire first. Anyhow, for a few bursts, he w went down and force landed and went on the back. I take over and 90 degree, I landed there. Of course, if anybody asked me why I was doing so, I said always from 1939 up to today, I was young, stupid, but lucky, that's all. Because I could kill myself during the landing and after I took off from it. I was flying PZL-11, uh, and uh, that was uh, the best fighter plane that we had. It was a bit old, actually, for a uh, world standard, but... Uh, it was a fantastic airplane, it was really very good. It was very difficult to catch up with the bombers. Uh, it had to be a little, a little above to just get an excess speed by diving. But uh, when you were at the same level or below, it was difficult. They, they could get away from it. Uh, so, what? as far as... Uh, fighting uh, uh, Messerschmitt uh, and uh, what well they were a little faster, uh, quite a bit faster, but we could overturn them. We make a tighter turn. So uh, you, if you get out of, out of his way and turn hard, you could, if you want to, to fight, uh, then you can get on his tail. Easy. But I had about two or three times dogfight with the 109. We've been better because if circle 109 was like this, I was inside him because I was slower. Mostly we tried to attack, for example, myself, in front. When bombers, we saw bombers and so on, we took, so we said straight on attack, you know, head on attack. Then we turn over. Before we left, there was a, uh, the largest operation that we had in here uh, during the Polish campaign. That was um, all that we have left in Warsaw. We were flying to uh, an area west of Warsaw uh, over uh, could not coin in uh, in the direction of Poznan, and uh, there was we were supposed to catch up with the big bomber <coughs> uh, 
formation of Germans. And then, and sure enough, we did. We met them. Although, you know, it was very difficult. There was no radar at this time, but, uh, uh, well, we, we met them. And it was uh, a big fight down there and uh, all over the place. I mean, everything was mixed up, everyone to himself. And uh, I had lost both of my, uh, I, I was leading a, a section of three, and uh, I lost uh, both of them. Uh, they, they didn't get killed, but they were shot down. Um, and uh, because I met them in, in, uh, later on in France. I got uh, order from commanding officer of the school to walk with uh, 50 cadets to Romania, because supposed to be some uh, English airplanes uh, waiting in uh, Romania. And our duty was to fly them to Poland and to fight. When we came to uh, Rom uh, to cross Romania, it was 17 of September, we find that Russia attacked Poland. So simply I decided to escape with my cadets. Supplies, fuel, and aircraft dwindling in the face of the heavy demands placed upon them, the Poles regrouped to the east only to have their tactics frustrated by the entry of the Soviet Union to the war. Honoring a secret treaty with Germany, the Soviets attack from the east on the 17th of September, denying the Polish Air Force any chance of receiving further supplies and promised aircraft. Unwilling to surrender, the airmen in groups and individually head for the Romanian or Hungarian borders to continue the fight abroad. I crossed Polish-Romanian border on the 17th of September, <clears throat> the same day when the Red Army, the Soviet Army, entered Poland. We walked into Romania and officially Romania and Poland were very friendly, but when the war broke out, the pressure of German diplomacy was stronger and stronger on Romania and on the Romanian government. In the consequence, we were interned officially to show the Germans that, we, that they follow their instructions or, so, or wishes or so whatever. But the internment was such that it was very easy to get out of it, to escape. I got false papers at the Polish embassy to France as a respond to General Sikorsky's formation Polish army in France. My neighbor had some little knife in his shoe, pen knife, and we cut uh, these ropes and we escaped to Romania and of course from Romania to Beirut, from Beirut to Marseille, France, and we were in a few bases in France. Altogether we had about uh, 12,000 already uh, flyers and ground to, to crew in France, but France didn't know what to do. So we were waiting a few weeks and um, Germans just started to bomb the airfields. And they did to take off because they did, they had enough airplanes. So they moved us from Marseille, from South France to Lyon. We were after some after organizing a Polish air force in France, uh, which took about three months before we got organized, and then we were sent to Lyon. And uh, they were started training on the f on their flight uh, airplanes, uh, and uh, then attached to various units, 
some of us anyway, and six of us uh, from same, this same squadron in Warsaw. Uh, we were attached to this group, the Shas 310. And uh, when the Germans attacked the friends, there we were, fight, fighting again. We were flying Bloch 152, I think, uh, which was the worst fighter plane I flew in. However, that was, <laughs> we had no choice. <laughs> and um, uh, we had a few operational flights would be moved around. We started somewhere close to Dunkirk. And I must say, I, I wasn't, uh, personally, I don't think anybody else was uh, very happy fl flying with French uh, guys. They were, we didn't like it because they were, we were always flying, uh, the three of us, always flying protecting the, them from the behind as the last section. Uh, so they felt quite safe, you know, by we are sitting behind. And uh, we had some experience already, so. And uh, whenever we met the Germans, they, uh, they just disappeared. And uh, there it was, I mean, by the time we got out of this wreck roll down there, they were already <laughs> celebrating victoires, as they called them. I don't think they, anybody was shooting at them. But they, so we didn't like that. The French treated us as warmongers, that we were the cause of that disastrous war. We shouldn't oppose Hitler. And they didn't want to fight. They really were reluctant to fight. The French, uh, uh, the squadron commander and uh, the pilots and everybody, they said, well, we come here to say goodbye to you, but where are you going? Where are you going? We're going home. And off they went. I said, hey, hey, you've forgotten something. And uh, we had this French uh, pilot badges given by them. I said, well, take that with you. We go home. Evacuating France for Britain in the company of the defeated British Expeditionary Force, the Poles found themselves hoping that their remaining ally had the will to persevere. From the beginning, a commanding officer of fighter command, uh, Marshal Dowding, didn't like to accept us as a fighter. He said they didn't fly in the modern airplanes, they don't speak English. But when Germans started to hit them more and more, so they took five of us uh, just uh, for test. After one day, we flew the Tiger Moth which is uh, much slower than a uh, sport car. <laughs> After one day, we took hurricanes, and the third day, they asked to, for dogfight. Of course, all of us, we won, because they had terrific experience. We had about uh, 3,000 uh, hours on the fighter airplanes. Besides, a uh, few of us were instructors. And uh, after, I think, one week, they uh, moved us uh, to uh, squadrons. In the beginning, uh, my English, for example, not was so good, but still I was enough to understand what they telling us, how to do, and so on. All this 5.1 squadron, uh, squadron leader Hogan was a very fine man and leader. He was always leading us so just close your eyes and go on to your side and shoot the hun. He didn't tell, but he was leading us straight to this big formation, for example, 12 of us attacking, sometimes 300, 400, and so on. 
we had to get through the screen of fighters and to attack them and so on. These chaps, uh, the, 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 I said, uh, the, uh, for example, the squadron were in, in one time where we, we were five of us. And uh, when I used to fly with the uh, Hogan, I d don't took very close, like, uh, you know, the, the I was like this. So he said, what, you, you frightened to, uh, to fly close? I said, no, sir. I have to look after. I switch off radio because I don't understand what you're talking about. I have to look all around. For example, I remember from the Battle of Britain when one squadron was attacked by Germans and they come back three of 12, uh, six of 12. And they, they haven't seen when they've been shot down, the six from the high. With 300 squadron now, I, um, they were equipped with ferry battles, and we continued training, and we were ready <coughs> for combat. We were um, put on, on alert, uh, ready to, to <coughs> go to or with uh, in flying uh, uh, jackets any time to take off in case the in invasion of uh, England was launched. The squadrons were uh, used for night bombing of Belgium, French uh, ports, where large numbers of uh, bar uh, barges and tugs were concentrated, so we were sent to knock them down while they were in the, in the ports. During the Battle of Britain, the Polish fighter pilots began to make a name for themselves when assigned to British squadrons. Their success was so pronounced that Air Marshal Dowding acquiesced to their demand for Polish fighter squadrons. The newly formed 302 and 303 fighter squadrons soon joined the existing 300 and 301 Polish bomber squadrons just in time for the critical October Blitz. Every day we met no less than 60 Messerschmitts and 100, uh, 200 we were fighting, but we were very lucky now. The situation was very, very tough. Uh, for us because usually they were flying, approaching uh, on a very high altitude, over 20,000 feet, so it takes only several minutes to cross uh, English Channel. When we just took off, they were very high and we still were below. And the best attack for fighter on fighter was just Dive. We are shooting like rocket. You know, we are just in the dark, and with the airplane is going on 250, boom! And sometimes we are shocked. And I just find about 60 bombers uh, before me. I had only six pilots, so I attacked with my D6 uh, airplanes, all echelon. <laughs> and they just dispersed. And uh, in one place was big hole in the clouds, and I saw middle of the London, and Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and two of them, these donors, just started to go to dive, probably, and to dive and to drop bomb on the, the Buckingham Palace. And I uh, was b behind them, they pro probably even didn't say I didn't pay attention. So I attacked one shot, second six shot, shot. So in that day we had few, of course, uh, flights, uh, and every flight was very, very busy. And uh, afternoon again, I shot two. It is very rare, but uh, in part of this we had too many of them for this position. I report to Squadron Leader Hogan. He said, how do you feel, OK? Yes, sir. I'm off hospital. I was lying. It's not true. He said to me, would you fly? I said, yes. Only I had 
still my leg something so I had a stick but I could fly he said one hour you make aerobatics you know reconnaissance uh, and so I flew 10 minutes I landed all the time I fried fire you know shock fire I landed. why 10 minutes oh all right I'm I was lying. I was frightened to fly. So you ready? I said, still lying. So I remember then it was flight Lieutenant Jones. So he said, said okay, so somebody he pushed from the standby and he was standby. I said, to I will stay by aeroplane because I can run. We well, are speaking, talking with the air crew, uh, ground crew and so on. And immediately a few minutes later, Red lights, we take off. I jumped on it. I was flying as a number two of his. And already then my English was better, so I listened to the radio. Give us 26,000 feet or something like this. And uh, over clouds, because we're 100% clouds, we were flying. And uh, I remember up to day. They flying north in front of you. Look to the left, down. I was number two, I was looking. Yes. I said to Jones, follow me. I saw, I, I see them. I went first, the squadron went after us. We shot down then seven or six. I shot down two, one on ice. This meeting with Germans, I didn't say shooting down to Hans, but this meeting, it was the shock get from me like a I didn't thought up today any fire about I was frightened and so on. I forget at all. It was, you know, shock after shock. I joined the 303 towards the end of battle. But, and I, I was looking forward to meet my best friend, uh, Yanushevich, uh, who I knew he was there. And then when I arrived, I was told he was shut down two days before. There was a cost for the Polish success. 29 Polish fighter pilots gave their lives during the Battle of Britain. The 144 Polish fighter pilots made up the largest non-British contingent during the Battle of Britain. They shot down 203 German aircraft, convincing the RAF to provide first-rate equipment and support, and by 1941, eight Polish fighter squadrons and four bomber squadrons were ready for combat. Much of the success was due to the methods and training unique to the Poles. The Polish Air Force at the first years they were the qualified pilots. You know, they, were, they had a good training from the uh, from majority of the officers were the, uh, the uh, graduates from the uh, Polish Academy in Dublin. And of course, you know, by comparison with, with, with English, or with the Americans, for that matter, I mean, they were volunteers, and they had some training, but see, training as a volunteer is entirely different and sometimes inadequate you know, to the training of the, uh, of the sort of, you know, pilots who have been trained for that purpose, you know, for, 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 for the war. First of all, the King's regulation in the fighter aircraft fighter squadron was 24 pilots and the commanding officer. Mm -hmm. In the Polish air, uh, f squadron, we got the permission to have up to 35. Because when the pilot came from the OTU, when we had some losses, uh, we trained them from the beginning. I never take a pilot who just came from the OTU to the, f f uh, to the um, to the fi fighter mission, you know, only when he had some practice and things like that. Quite a number of bad weather, number of days when the bad weather we did not fly. So uh, we all provided with bicycles, and of course uh, I took the bicycles, 12 bicycles, the chaps who were out of the strength of 20 or whatever, took 12 and got them on the runway, and they uh, taught them how to fly on bicycles, air formation flying, the turning, of course we couldn't do the turning absolutely the same, but at least there was similarity 
and, and what I was thinking. It is the most important, perhaps, things that the Polish squadron were flying different formation. And our formation was very well protected, protected against the German attack because it was four, it's uh, three, uh, four. It was the leading four, the commanding officer, number two and number three, and number four. And then the right four and the left four. The right four protected the leading uh, four and the left, and the left protected the leading. And it was very difficult to jump on us. As the English was flying four, three, one after another, was the leading three, then number two, number three, and number four. And they were always, always jump from the back. And uh, our Air Force was flying entirely different formation, and uh, our formation was definitely superior. But the English, for some reason, didn't want to uh, adapt that, 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 formation, that formation. The Polish bomber crews, after the Battle of Britain, played a critical role in British Air Marshal Harris's plans to take the war to the enemy. The early years found the Poles contributing up to a sixth of all available bomber force. As late as May 1942, during the first 1,000 bomber raids over Cologne, Germany, the Poles contributed 101 air crews. Bomber command des decided to let the f four aircraft already airborne to fly on their mission. And um, <coughs> the, the, mm, the f uh, flight was very easy, undisturbed, uh, weather was fine, uh, so we managed to get to Berlin with no problem. Uh, after the uh, uh, dropping the bombs on a given target, <coughs> we noted that artillery started uh, f firing. Fer first two salvos d uh, were uh, not uh, accurate, and uh, we were uh, po po uh, positively warned that we are being targeted. So, uh, Flight Lieutenant Sulinski, the, the captain, decided to make the evasive uh, maneuvers. That means he was climbing, he was uh, changing course all the time. And uh, the one uh, <coughs> uh, massive firing was going on, <coughs> we managed to get through without being uh, hit. It, uh, it went uh, for three times, because they had three belts of defense around Berlin. so we noticed that there were uh, brief uh, periods of quiet and then another big um, uh, shooting. After that, uh, the return journey was un uneventful and we landed in, uh, in our base at Swinderby early in the morning. The mechanical problems were seldom because our uh, mechanics were excellent, and uh, each aircraft was prepared at the most careful, uh, skillful uh, work of mechanics. Mechanics were uh, as assigned to certain to service certain aircraft, so it was always the same mechanic on, the, on that uh, aircraft. So they knew the equipment very well and how it behaves and, and so on. So they were uh, <coughs> uh, part of the crew. After the Battle of Britain was finished, the tactics changed completely. From the purely defense action, we started to fly over France, Belgium, and, and, and Holland to fight the German uh, there and to fight also the uh, 
small factories and troops and things like that. We've been flying quite intensively, sometimes twice a day, uh, for the short trips like over the channel, you see, or the scramble, as we said you know, at that time. We were already sitting in the aircraft in um, uh, the very early days in order to get airborne in time and prevent any bombers to get through to, uh, to uh, London in particular. Personally, I, I dislike to, to do the, uh, the low-level stuff. Uh, only because the defense, the coast defense, was tremendous. If you had to cross, cross the, you know, on the way back, you see, on the way to France, you could surprise them. You know, when you kept really low, perhaps maybe last two miles, you know, they pick you up. But going back, you know, they knew you were there, and they knew that you got to cross the coast, you see. And that was pretty, I didn't like that. Didn't like that at all. We didn't like rubabs because uh, enemy aerodromes especially, Germans were being very strongly defended by all kinds of 40 millimeters machine guns and so on. Too many p pilots were lost, not ours, G uh, English and so on. It, it was incredible. I mean, there were so many losses. They, f they forgot about this particular type of mission. We never had it, the repetition of this. Uh, I remember that from my squad now I was the only one who 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 was who landed uh, at Norfolk uh, because once we got fire from every corner, you see, uh, then we, you know I was flying between the buildings, but buildings along the street because I thought that that at least you know, so they were shooting from from the from the from the top of the buildings to that angle at me. And it was funny because during my op op operations, uh, and I got 555 of them, you know, my credit, I didn't bring back a single hole in my aircraft. And every time you landed, uh, the, the mechanic used to go around immediately around the aircraft at dispersal to see if the, what sort of damage it is. And that particular time, he came, he came with his thumbs up. I said, Christ, I've got the hole. At last, at least I was there. I said. <laughs> And then uh, when I got out of the aircraft, he pulled out a piece of telephone wire, <laughs> which I picked up on my tail wheel. By the time of the Dieppe invasion, the Poles had resorted to ever more novel approaches to overcoming the restrictions imposed by flying over enemy territory. With Johnny Zumbach, uh, who was uh, CO of 306, uh, 303, and I was 317 squadron commander. And we uh, sort of uh, trying to find out how we can make a party with the Germans and to put them down, sort of. So when we, call, when we got all news from RT, where the Germans are, how strengths they are, and so on, so depends, we th throw the money, uh, the money uh, uh, half a crown, who is uh, attacking who is as a target. So, if for example I was a target 317 squadron, so I've got all news and I'm going down to uh, as lower as Germans are to try them to attack me. Well then Zumbach 3 or 3 squadron going higher, so Germans were between us. But they look at us. They can't see 303 squadron, Zumbaha. So when they going down, after attacking me, so by RT I call or him, or depends who, I said, go down because I have enough. They are too f close to us. So we split up, and they attacking. Of course, always we had the good results. By the end of 1942, American bomber forces were based in Britain. We did a awful lot of flying, escorting uh, American bombers. There was a pretty hot period, really. We were flying two missions a day sometime, and the, and the long flights, very long flights with the, uh, you know, the extra tanks in under the wings and. Uh, so we had a lot of fuel then. 
we were flying uh, at, uh, long flights because of the bombers to fly with them as just as far as possible so they are not left without escort. Uh, at that time, uh, the American fighters were not operating yet. There was one bomber squad, a bond, one bomber group in the theater at the time, but there were no fighter uh, units that were American. So uh, I, uh, in turn, was assigned to the ferry squad to ferry aircraft building up our forces throughout, the, uh, throughout England. During this time period, why the Poles were receiving uh, an awful lot of publicity in the United States to the job that they did during the Battle of Britain and afterwards. So I felt that the Polish uh, uh, pilots were uh, kind of superior to uh, a good many of them. And I thought, while I was in Hawaii after December 7th, uh, that if uh, everything is equal, I would like to go to, go to Europe and uh, get my, uh, what you call, operational experience with the Poles. So after a period of time, uh, I s saw one of my commanders from, uh, uh, from Hawaii come off of a uh, transport aircraft, who's a full colonel, and uh, it was a uh, Colonel Landry was uh, was the name of the individual. He says, "What are you doing here, Landry?" He says, "Well, I'm going to form the f f uh, fighter command." He says, "The embryonic stages of the F fighter command," and I told him what my problem was. I says, "I came over to fly with the poles for training purposes, and says so far they assigned me here to fly uh, the airplanes at Presley, and uh, I would like to." join up with the Polish forces as soon as possible. I had a message by uh, adjutant in the squadron. He called me, he said, look, do you know we, we get the Yankee coming in the, into our squadron? I said, what the hell? I called uh, Anders. He was one of uh, my pilots in uh, 315. And I said, no. Oh, you look after him. He came to my, my, my flight, you see, which I commanded at that time. And I took him, you know, under my wing, so to speak, you know, and took him out because he never flew the combat mission. The Poles' reputation and desire for combat propelled them into the skies over Africa and even the Far East. Our best friend, he was commanding officer of the fighter command, sir. Sholto Douglas, he was transferred to cover uh, Mediterranean theater of war with the headquarters in Cairo. And he sent his message uh, to HQ RAF, send me some posts, I haven't got any of them in my theater. And I was told that I am supposed to be organized, 15 pilots, uh, I, I supposed to take over this Polish fighting team to North Africa. I told my pilots, we have to show them the first takeoff. We can fly in a good way, <laughs> you know. Already it will go, because they didn't know us. They've been interested how they're flying, what they kind of a pilots they are. After first, I should say, success of ours, first flight, they look at us, uh, not only friendly, but with the, ah, they know the job. And uh, the rest of uh, our sort of combats over the North Africa until the May, uh, May, the end of May, something like this. So we shot down 25 aeroplanes and losing one pilot, Vyshkovsky, who was taken as prisoner. One day in Washington, D.C., I met General Chenault. And he said, oh, Major Urbanovich, because we had two ranks. I had a wing commander of British uh, Air Force and Polish Major. Oh, Major, I was looking for you. 
Do you like to chase uh, the Japanese in there? And they say, yes, I love to do it. Oh, yes, I invite you. And uh, I came to Henyang. It was Squadron 70, his squadron, very famous American squadron. And I flew with them. Uh, it was October, November, December, a little even a little bit in January. And my, uh, mostly we were flying escorting bombers. We were escorting bombers and uh, sometimes strafing. It was very, very exciting for us, strafing uh, Japanese airfields, but very, was of course very dangerous. And once we took off to the east to intercept uh, Japanese uh, bombers and fighters coming from bombing some uh, targets in uh, China. It was uh, about 200 miles inside of Japanese area. It is no fun. Naturally, they, they didn't have radar like, for instance, British. I saw approaching this uh, about maybe 30 bombers and fighters. And commanding officer in that time was uh, Major Richardson, he's now a retired colonel in Texas. And uh, we are looking, for instance, I was suddenly find a fighter, Japanese hero, we call them Zero, but we find that later that they were the Oscar. And uh, one airplane, P-40, was attacked by two Zeros, I called, on his tail. So he's finished. But I looked around to the left, to the right, nobody was around, only I had two. It was about maybe 100 only uh, on the uh, tail. So I never had such better and beautiful position because they were fanatics. Usually the Japanese, if they start to shoot, they don't pay, uh, pay attention to what is going around. So I uh, had full ammunition, full, just uh, in my airplane. So I was shooting a little short, like this, one second out. And I find that uh, these two Japanese were sitting on the table of uh, Major Richardson, commanding officer. So <clears throat> he wrote a letter to General Arnold and I got uh, Air Medal and uh, American Wings. The bomber missions over Germany caused great losses among the RAF and Polish squadrons. The Poles, having few manpower sources, pulled from the Army to keep the bombers flying. 305 Squadron was converted to Mosquitoes, which required fewer crewmen, and 304 sent to Coastal Command to minimize losses. However, 300 Squadron converted to the Lancaster Heavy Bomber and participated in every major raid over Germany. Polish fighter squadrons penetrated even deeper into Germany after some squadrons were equipped with the new Mark III Mustang. Escort missions remained tense, as recounted by squadron leader Anders. My wingman was, uh, I think he was about three times, that was the third or fourth, uh, and uh, we were top cover. And uh, the formation, the, the wing was led by, by uh, wing commander Zumba. And he, has a, he had a way of expression which was uh, uh, not always the, uh, the proper uh, expression which he used, uh, but you know, he, he didn't mind. I mean, he, he, if he thought about something, he just said it. So uh, the, my wingman, so I was going south, but, you know, towards Paris. My wingman saw two aircraft, you know, you can see, you know, when the key turned, they, they, because the sun is behind them, you can see the flick, the, the lights, you see, and the, the, the reflection of the aircraft, you can see it. So we knew that, 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 that 
like two acres over there. But uh, from when we were squatting, we started at a high level. So by the time we reach the channel, we know exactly how many aircraft are already airborne. You see? And they, they come from everywhere, these aircraft. By the time you get the French coast, you know that there's over 100 Messerschmitts or Fokkerbult or combination of the two waiting for you. So, um, and all these aircraft were on the left side, higher up, or the enemy aircraft, and going, coming, going along with us. They knew that we are going to leave the uh, bombers uh, before we reach the, 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 uh, the target, you see. Now, going back to these two, uh, he said two buggies, you know, whatever you s in Polish. You know. And uh, nobody answered anything. I mean, everybody knew it, but he was new. I thought he was. And then again, after a few minutes, again, two buggies, you know, right high, whatever, two o'clock, you know, and all that nonsense. And, uh, and then uh, I tried to sort of contact him visually because he was a little bit too far away and uh, showing him, to, you know, to, to, to stop talking, you see. But, you know, he didn't see my sign. And I didn't want to talk to him. I said, because it was up to the leader of the wing commander who led the, with him. So <laughs> what he said then after the third, he couldn't, he couldn't maintain the silence anymore. He says, now look left, and you will shit your pants off, he says. Because on the left there was a hundred plus aircraft, and he was worried about the two aircraft we was flicking them. So there was a... a there was the uh, silence for a minute, and he said, in Polish, of course, he says, I looked and carried out your order, <laughs> which was you know, absolutely wonderful. See, can you imagine the atmosphere? You sit alone in an aircraft. You cannot share your anxiety with anybody else. You know you're on your own there. By 1943, the Polish Air Force found itself not only fighting for mastery in the skies over Europe, but aiding in the creation of a Polish parachute brigade and in assisting the underground army in Poland. The commander in the chief of Polish forces, General Władysław Sikorski, realized that he needed parachutists to maintain liaison with the underground army in Poland and also saw the need to raise a brigade of armed troops to be the first to return to Poland to liberate that country from the Nazis. A cadre unit in Scotland under the command of Colonel Stanislaw Sosobowski was to be converted into a brigade. And from throughout the Polish armed forces, volunteers were called to join a special branch of the armed forces, the Cichocemne, known as the Silent and Einstein who would be parachuted into Poland for sabotage, intelligence gathering, and liaison work with the Polish underground forces. The first Polish parachute candidates were sent to Ringway already by December 1940. Naturally, they were trained by the two Polish speakers there, Gambowicz and Gorecki. More and more Polish troops First, as individuals started arriving in Ringway, but then entire platoons being sent from the cadre brigade. At this point, it was seen that there should be a separate Polish jump school formed at Ringway. Gambowicz and Gorecki would continue their duties on the staff of the British Parachute Training School, but they would be in charge of the Polish section of this same school. On August 1, 1944, the Polish underground home army, Armia Krajowa, began an uprising in Warsaw, wanting to liberate Poland's capital before the Soviet army, positioned east of the city, could accomplish this task. The uprising quickly turned into a huge and prolonged battle. The Germans fought fiercely to suppress it and poured large number of troops into Warsaw. Stalin saw an opportunity to eliminate the patriotic Armia Krajowa with its ties to the London government and hindered help to the besieged city by not allowing Soviet-controlled territory to be used for support of the uprising. 
In August, long-range night missions from Brindisi to aid the uprising commenced. In the first weeks of the uprising, 1586 Polish flight made 83 sorties, losing 16 of its 18 crews. The other Polish bomber squadrons were stripped of their crews to replace them, and a number of British and South African crews stationed in northern Italy volunteered to make the perilous flight. Of the 196 sorties, 91 by Polish crews only, 42 managed to reach Warsaw and drop their loads. A further 39 planes were lost. Despite a valiant battle lasting three months, the failure of Soviet ground forces to assist the Poles doomed the uprising. With the Armia Krajowa crushed, Poland's fate now lie in the hands of the great powers. Unknown to most Poles fighting abroad was that their country had been ceded to Soviet control by the secret Yalta Agreement. It was uh, something which It's hard to say. I saved two lives because they suicided. They cannot stand anymore. As far as uh, the Polish squadron, mind you that during the uprising, the squadron were almost twice replaced. The only man not intact was uh, the squadron leader, because uh, he was ordered not to fly, and, ho and his uh, adjutant. All men were dying. Ironically, although the Polish squadrons were unable to save their own capital because of the great distance involved, they found themselves in 1944 again protecting the British capital from a second blitz, Hitler's vaunted V-weapons. I was transferred to 315 uh, uh, Squadron. Uh, squadron commander was, we call him Jubek, was the Horbaczewski. And the, at that time, we were defending the London from the flying bombs. We called them doodle box V1s. We went on the patrols, and the operation was calling us, you know, for example, doodle box is approaching from uh, angel so and so, angel, that means the uh, altitude, so and so, uh, so we were preparing, you know, and we were trying to destroy the flying bombs before it reached uh, London. In 1944, during the Yalta Conference, the Great Powers placed Poland under the Soviet sphere of influence. This placed Polish forces in the West in great peril. These forces were very anti-Soviet and very anti-communist and they were dedicated to regaining a free Poland. The Allied desire to seek rapprochement with the USSR, however, was great and led to a visible undermining of the Polish position in the West. This came to a head during the Victory Parade in 1945 in London, where the Polish armed forces were specifically not invited. An interesting aside is the rebellion that was started among the Allies, especially the British airmen who wanted their Polish counterparts to participate in the parade. Personalities such as Douglas Bader, the famous RAF ace, and many others were very vocal in supporting the Poles' desire to march, but unfortunately their protestations were to no avail. We felt very much betrayed by the Allies, and very bitter about it. But life has to go on, and uh, it did go on. The war really ended for us in 1989. I remember I was in Warsaw in preparation for the, um, for the reunion that was going to happen in 19, I guess, uh, 1992, where we are going to bring our standard 
from England to Poland and turn it over to the, to the current Polish Air Force. And I think in 91, I was uh, visiting with an American ambassador in Warsaw. And he asked me for a little bit, of what is the union all about? And I said, essentially, this is an end of the war for us. Now, not 45, but right now, where we can bring our standard back to Poland. Yeah. 